we are going to go over our chapter on materialism, the industrial era, and the urban scene from 1850 to 1900. And we are going to see how uh, the effects of industrialization are changing art and society. After that, I am going to kind of switch gears and talk about a contemporary artist named Jeff Koons, who people either seem to love or hate. And we will kind of see how the effect of industrialization helps to create his art. And also look at the effect of a consumer society that is reflected also within his art too. And one of the reasons that I choose him is that it's easy for us to see his art here in Southern California where our class is uh, at the Broad Museum in downtown LA. You can see his giant steel a balloon dog and kind of get a, a sense for yourself of the industrial processes. And also I think it's kind of interesting to see people looking at themselves in the reflected shiny steel. So let's get into this. So in the decades after 1850, the industrial technologies of steam power, coal, and iron bring the West into a position of dominance over less industrialized part of the world. Electricity, synthetic paints, photography are providing new ways of viewing one's natural surroundings and recording everyday experiences. Cast iron and mass-produced steel revolutionize building methods and designs, and the age of materialism incorporates two major movements in the arts, realism and impressionism. Both call for the objective, unidealized record of the physical world and the bitter realities of lower class life, and the pleasures and pastimes of the urban scene. France emerges as the center of Western artistic productivity, and Paris will become a melting pot for artists, composers, and writers. Following the last Impressionist show in 1886, a rich experience of expressive, exotic, and formal post-Expressionist style will bring the century to a close. London and Paris host World's Fairs, that introduce cultures of non-Western nations to many Europeans, and the arts of Japan, Africa, and Oceania will have a visual impact on the West that will in, uh, continue into the 20th century with Pablo Picasso and Cubism being influenced by African masks, Egyptian motifs, and also um, uh, Mayan motifs. So the industrial age. Industrialism is bringing new economic and military basis for the West rise in their domination. Things like steam power, coal and iron, and the railroad is facilitating economic and political expansion. The first iron rails are forged in Britain in 1789. In 1804, Britain builds their first steam railway locomotive. By 1850, there are 23,000 miles of rail track across Europe, linking coal mines in Germany to factories and markets. And with the railroad is also uh, bringing other ages of industrialization. By the end of the 19th century, we have the internal combustion engine, the telegraph and the telephone and the camera. And we also have in 1873 uh, a, treatise on, a treatise on electricity and the magnet by uh, James Maxwell, who is explaining that light waves consisting of electromagnetic particles produce radiant energy. In 1879, American inventor Thomas Edison creates the incandescent light bulb. In 1880, the telephone is created. In the 1880s, Thomas Edison will help the development of film. In the 1890s, we have the invention of modern motor cars. And all of this is going to be helping with uh, the development of, or helped because of the, the development of processed steel, aluminum, and the steam turbine, the pneumatic tire, all product of the 1880s. And then also in terms of weaponry, the machine gun is also invented. 
This will lead to further colonization and new imperialism. Europe has expanded into Asia and Africa and have been doing so since about 1500. After the Industrial Revolution, the imperialism is transforming these territories into outright colonial possessions. They are taking their raw materials. They are establishing economic, political, and cultural dominance in places like India in 1858, where the British will rule, in China. They have ended the long history of independence in China. The triangular trade patterns in opium and tea between India, China, and Great Britain will lead to warfare and also devastation amongst the Chinese. Probably the most dramatic example, though, of the new imperialism is in Africa. In 1880, European nations control only about 10% of Africa. By 1900, all of Africa except for Ethiopia and Liberia have been carved up by the Europeans and are introducing models of political and economic authority with very little regard for the indigenous population. America in 1853 will force Japan to begin trading with them and that will begin the modernization of Japan. In the United States there is manifest destiny and the United States will expand all the way to the Pacific Ocean, uh, into Mexico, and also out into the Philippines and Cuba. Now the social and economic realities of all of this. So in the 1800s, there was a very kind of limited industrial profit that came from accumulating capital. However, because of the advances in machine technology and factories, we have a small group of people, middle class entrepreneurs, who are organizing and managing and assuming the risks of business, and an even smaller number of capitalists who are providing money for the, for financing these businesses. So this is creating wealth in a very small part of the population. All poor people have are their own labor and factory laborers including women and children will work under dirty and dangerous conditions sometimes up to 16 hours a day. And they are not really being paid very much. Children are not being educated in fact, in, there was a law that was passed in 1833 in Britain to make sure that children were being educated. Not children 9 to 13 were given two hours of education a day, but the factory was deciding how they were being educated. In the Iron Law of Wages, this met, was a, an economic principle that said you only have to pay whatever you need for people to accept the jobs. And so if people are desperate enough to accept a job where they don't get paid much, then that's the law of, of, of the, the capitalist system. There's no government safety net in this period. There's no workers' compensation. There's no unemployment insurance, no Social Security. Clearly the reason that the government needs to step in and also clearly the reason that unions need to exist. Now what this is going to do is we're going to see a number of peasant uprisings between 1855 and 1861 and a new idea called socialism is going to emerge. So socialism is attacking capitalism as a system that encourages inequality and exploitation of labor. Socialists call for common ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution in the interest of public good. And society according to the socialists should operate entirely on the interests of people. Karl Marx is agreeing with the socialists and he believes that bourgeois capitalism corrupts humanity and his theory of social reform believes in a violent revolution that would destroy the old order and usher in a new society. He joins with scientists and, journal and journalist Frederick Engels, and they will write the Communist Manifesto in 1848 and also form an association called the Communist League. They believe that human history 
is exclusively materialistic in its terms. They argue that the conditions under which one earns a living determines all other aspects of their life. He is very similar to Hegel and a student of Hegel, and he believes that there is a thesis, the struggle between those who have, and an antithesis between those who have not, and that the synthesis should be a classless society. He is deriving the utopian idea of the perfectibility of the state. The end product of his dialectic change is a society free of class antagonism and the ultimate dissolution of the state itself. The Communist Manifesto is a sweeping condemnation of the effects of capitalism on the individual and society at large. He argues that capitalism puts money into a few hands and ultimately oppresses the impoverished proletariat or the working class. The psychological effects are devastating. Workers are alienated by their own productive efforts and that alienation leads to further alienation in society. He is calling for a revolution by which workers will seize the instruments of capitalist production and abolish private ownership. Friedrich Nietzsche is a philosopher and a professor of Greek at the University of Basel. He is voicing the sentiments of the radical moralist. Deeply critical of his own time, he calls for a revision in all values. He rejects organized religion, calling it a slave morality. He is equally critical of democratic institutions, which he sees the embodiment of rule by mass mediocrity. He calls instead for a superman or a superior individual in Ubermensch, great man theory from my last chapter, whose singular vision and, and courage would, in his view, produce a master morality. He did not launch any ideas for this new form or this system, but rather gave us aphorisms, short phrases expressing general truth or principles, and maxims, short, concise, often witty sayings. So he said things like, is man merely the mistake of God's or God merely the mistake of man's? He also claims that God is dead. In his view, Western materialism had generated decadence and decline, and his negation of the absolute moral truth will anticipate the nihilism of 20th century thinkers. He believes that progress is a false idea. Mankind surely does not represent an evolution towards better or stronger or higher level. As progress is now understood, this progress is merely a modern idea to which is to say is a false idea. So we are not with our technology getting any better. We are simply uh, running in circles. Literary realism is a, a, a realism that is studying the effects of capitalism and against the realities of poverty and inequality. Social criticism is what it's all about and begins in 1830. So the realist credo is depicting life in complete candor compared with romanticism, which embraced heroic and exotic subjects. Realism is portraying men and women in actual, everyday, often demoralizing situations. It's examining the social consequences of materialism on the plight of the working class and the subjugation of women. And while it doesn't totally displace romanticism as the dominant literary mode of the 19th century, it, it is definitely a, a part of that literary uh, um, culture of the time. Charles Dickens is one of the maybe great literary realists. He writes Oliver Twist. 
that is portraying slums and orphanage and boarding schools in London. Nicholas Nickaby, a bitter indictment on the brutally run rural schools. And David Copperfield in 1850 condemns debtors prisons and the conditions that produce them. His novels are frequently theatrical. His characters are drawn to the point of uh, character and his themes suggest that sentimental faith in kindness and good cheer is the best antidote for the bitterness of contemporary life. In America, we have Samuel Clemens, known as Mark Twain. He is setting his stories in the rural farmlands along the Mississippi River. His Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, published in 1884, is a sequel to the popular boys' book, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Huck is uh, a young narrator in Huckleberry Finn, and him and runaway slave Jim make their way down the Mississippi River in a ramshackle raft. Huck is poor and ignorant but good-hearted, a southern white boy who is experiencing a crisis of conscience, which he must choose between aiding a fugitive slave, which is a felony offense in the slave states, and he should and must or should he obey, uh, and by obeying the law, if he did that, he would turn over his friend Jim, or should he help Jim escape because he's a man and his friend? So he faces this kind of moral dilemma of the whole system of chattel slavery, the idea that slaves were considered property and could be bought and sold or stolen, and Huck is going to opt to help Jim escape. He's going to aid the man even though he violates the law in harboring Jim the slave. More pessimistic than Dickens or Twain, Dostoevsky is, uh, and Leo Tolstoy are writers who are bred, born and bred into wealth but will turn against the upper class Russian society and sympathize with the plight of the lower classes. In his landmark novel, War and Peace, he is uh, uh, often hailed as the greatest example of realistic Russian fish fiction. He traces the life of five families whose destinies unroll against the background of Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812. In this sprawling narrative, Tolstoy exposes the privileged position of nobility and the cruel exploitation of the great masses of Europe. Dostoevsky, he's paying greater attention maybe than Tolstoy to philosophic and psychological issues. The characters in Dostoevsky's novels are often victims of dual plights of poverty and conscience. In Crime and Punishment, the protagonist, a young poor student, murders an old woman and her younger sister. His crime, however, goes undetected. Struggling with the guilt, he asks whether extraordinary people, by dint of their uniqueness, bear a right to commit more immoral acts. Gustav Flaubert, Flaubert is a representative of a number of 19th century writers whose works are examining the everyday lives of middle-class women in their time, and especially how they're affected by the social conventions and personal values of the times. These literary heroines did not create the world in their own image, rather in a world more specifically that are a social and economic environment that they are molded into that govern their destinies. Madame, Madame Bovary, that is published in 1857, his landmark novel. We are looking at a woman who is afflicted by boredom in her mundane existence, educated in a covenant, in a coven, in a covenant and married to a dull small town physician. She tries to live out the fantasies that fill the pages of romance novels, but her efforts to escape her circumstances lead to her destruction. So Flaubert, whose critics have called uh, have called the inventor called him the inventor of the modern novel, stripped his stories of interpretive detail and sentimentality. 
aim to describe with perfect precision both the material world and the psychological makeup of his characters, he commits himself to finding the exact word, a practice that often prevented him for writing more than one or two pages per week. Mil Zola. He is going to initiate a variant of literary realism known as naturalism. Naturalists are different from realists in taking a deterministic approach that showed human beings are products of environments and hereditary factors over which they have very little control. Just as Marx will hold or held that economic life shapes all aspects of culture, naturalists believe that material and social elements determine the human condition. In his ambition to describe the world with absolute fidelity, Zola amassed notebooks of information on wider variety of subjects, including railroads, the stock market, the science of surgery. He treated the novel as a carefully researched study of commonplace material existence. He presented a slice of life, a slice of life that showed how social and material circumstances influence human behavior. A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen. So a Norwegian uh, dramatist, he is uh, rebelling against the artificial social conventions that lead people to pursue the self-deluding and hypocritical lives that they live. He is shocking the public by writing prose dramas, addressing controversial subjects like insanity, incest, and venereal disease. He is exploring universal themes of conflict between the individual and society, and between love and duty, and between a husband and wife. His landmark drama of female liberation is called The Dow's, A Doll's House, that is published in 1879. He's tracing the awakening of a middle-class woman to the meaninglessness of her role as a doll wife living in a doll's house, in quotes. Threatened with blackmail over a debt she incurred years earlier, Nora Helmer looks to her egotistical husband, Torvald, for protection. When he fails to rally to her defense, she realizes the frailty of her dependent lifestyle. She comes to recognize that her first obligation is to herself and to her dignity as a human being. Her self-discovery leads to the end of her marriage. She shuts the door on past illusions and turns her back on any sort of romantic idealism. The play ends without disclosing the outcome of Nora's decision to leave her family and children. late 19th century architecture. So cast iron is providing new strength without more bulk. It is allowing architects to span broader widths and raise structure to greater heights than they could with traditional masonry. There is, uh, in England, John Nash had used cast iron in 1850 as the, structuralist f as the structural frame for the Brighton Pavilion. And then in the mid-century, they begin to use iron as skeletal supports for mills and warehouses, and then begin to put together other parts of the building with kind of traditional masonry. In Joseph Paxson's Crystal Palace in London in 1851 for the great exhibition there, it is the first prefabricated building and the forerunner of functional steel and glass architecture that we see in the 20th century. Cast entirely of iron and in girders and glass and 18,000 panes of glass, it's erected in nine months and is 1,851 feet long. Light enters through the transparent walls uh, and windows and they have a massive show celebrating the industrial age and then later are able to deconstruct it completely. Like the Crystal Palace, the Eiffel Tower it was a novelty but becomes a, an emblem of early modernism. 
So this is constructed by the engineer Gustav, Gustav Eiffel for the World's Fair in 1889. It is 1,000 feet tall, a cast iron skeleton with elevators, a new invention, that offer visitors magnificent aerial views of palace. Aesthetically, the tower links architectural traditions in the past and the future. Its sweeping curves and delicate, delicate tracery and dramatic verticality recall the glories of the Gothic cathedral, while its majestic ironwork anticipate the austere abstractions of the international style in architecture in the 20th century. The skyscraper. So in the age of advancing industrialism, in 1850, there are seven American cities with more than 100,000 people, and they need to come up with ways to house them. So in a new technology of steel, a medium that is perfected in 1856, it's lighter and stronger and more resilient than cast iron. They could use a frame to carry the entire weight of the structure and then don't need to have as much weight for weight-bearing masonry walls. By the 1880s, architects and engineers unite the steel frame with the elevator to raise structures more than 10 stories high. American architect uh, Louis Sullivan is designing multi-story buildings in places like Buffalo and St. Louis. He is reflecting on the simplicity that form should follow function and the skyscraper is ultimately going to become the entire landscape of cities. Although we will ultimately get rid of, you'll notice in Sullivan's buildings that he's emphasizing the verticality, but he's also not really going all the way to just showing the steel and the glass, still covering the ball, the walls and stuff with masonry and designs and things and decorations that is something that is going to disappear in the 20th century. The birth of photography. So photography has its beginnings uh, with William Henry Fox Talbot when he creates the negative and pros positive process that allows for multiple prints to come out of a camera obscura. Well, the camera obscura is developed by Louis de Gour, who is playing around with light-sensitive metal plates, fixing them with chemicals like silver iodine. But Talbot is coming up with a new form where he is developing pictures on celluloid, and then through the darkroom and other photomechanical processes, he is developing paper, uh, um, paper multiples. And this is going to liberate art from painting having to be realistic anymore. So now photos are going to be a clearer and cheaper and faster way to show the realities of cities and also the devastation of war as well that we get from Matthew Brady's photographs of the American Civil War. So, this new art, we're going to begin to see painting that, although is called realist, is actually not as functionally realistic, say, as some of the paintings that we saw from Raphael, like um, the painting that he does of Pope Leo that is, is really realistic. We had seen realism starting to devolve into something more painterly in the Romantic era, and that is going to be true with realist painting. So the realism is not about does the art look like a mirror that reflects the world. Instead, it's about the subject matters. So a realist painter, and Gustav Courbet is going to be one of the real important ones, he believes that a painter should only paint what they can see. And that in Courbet's work, he says, show me an age and I'll paint you one. So he is painting burials of common people. He is showing us workers on the job working and doing them in monumental size that was usually reserved for coronations and 
great people in history. We are seeing here, we are seeing the back-breaking labor of the working class as they are breaking up roads uh, to make gravel. In France, Jean-Francois Millet, sower, we are seeing a, uh, a farmer throwing seeds and working pre-tractor in back-breaking farm labor. From artists like Daumier, Daumier is a social realist working in lithography and he's also making painters as well. So lithography is a printmaking process by which you draw on stones and then when you draw on those stones you can make prints on them. It's a little bit different than the engraving process that we would have seen from Dürer in the Northern Renaissance. In his images he is um, making fun of human weakness. He is looking at the silliness of people and how they behave, especially the wealthy. He is skeptical of technology and uh, of social progress, just like Nietzsche. Winslow Homer. Homer is an American realist who is showing us the reality of the Civil War, showing us the reality of farming. He is uh, also painting um, uh, people that are in helpless situations. So in France, we have the State Art School in Paris that was developed by King Louis XIV and the Ecole Beaux Arts is a, uh, the school, the official Paris school, and it has a official kind of professors. It is somewhat conservative, and they are having in beginning in 1721 the Paris Salon, an official art exhibition of the Academy. Between 1748 and 1890, it, become, it becomes an annual or biannual the art event in the Western world. Initially, they were only using recent graduates of the school, but they are ultimately going to allow other artists to submit artwork that could be accepted or not be accepted, and then hanging them to the ceiling, just covering the, the walls in art, not the way kind of museums do it today. So this official showing was really important for artists. It's going to lead to commissions. It's going to lead to name recognition. However, by 1863, there are so many artists who are being rejected, they might riot. So that's when they have the Salon of the Refusals. And in the Salon of the Refusals in 1863, we get a painting that is going to begin to kind of further kind of change the world, the realism of Edward Manet. So Manet is showing us contemporary life, not from the working class, but from the middle class. In the luncheon in the grass, we see a nude woman enjoying a picnic lunch, like the fete gallants that the romantic artists, the Rococo artists were doing. And we see two fully clothed men in middle class clothing. And we see an art that was, ca was cast in terms. So female nudity had been accepted as long as it was cast in classical myth or allegory. But seeing a contemporary woman in contemporary life was considered scandalous. So it looks as if perhaps there has been a picnic, perhaps an orgy, and the uh, woman is facing us directly the modeling of her skin was criticized as not having the values in terms of the darks and the lights that you would normally have in figure drawing. And you can see the chiaroscuro here in a fete gallant earlier. We believe that's because he's painting from a photograph rather than from life, and the flash of the photograph is creating a lot of highlights on her body. He is also using the configuration of these figures from a, a print made by Raphael. And 
um, or I'm sorry, by uh, Raimondi's uh, The Judgment of Paris after a drawing by Raphael. And the, he is basically telling us he is purely appropriating art at this point. That he is a, he's unabashedly, unashamedly letting you know where he is kind of stealing his images from. And think about how that affects not only art today, but things like memes on the internet. In Manet's Olympia, we see him once again appropriating an earlier painting by the Phoenician Renaissance artist Titian. And he is taking a young virginal bride who is laying on a bed with the dog signaling her fidelity. She is looking at us in a way that is inviting us to look at her nude body. In Manet's Olympia, we see a prostitute who is looking at us in a manner that is very direct and not particularly friendly. And she is wearing the accoutrements of a prostitute with the flower in her hair and the choker. And again, this was scandalous, representing what was perceived to be the lowest part of society, a sex worker, as contemporary art. The next wave of art that comes in the 1780s and the, 18, in the 1880s, they are not ideal, idealizing nature the way the Romantics did. They are rejecting traditional themes from history, and they are showing us contemporary scene, scenes and are really interested in pure perception. They're creating luminous canvases, and Monet is the pioneer of this new Impressionism. So he has, in 1874, a, lane, a landmark painting called Impression Sunrise. He is painting a seascape, which says more how one sees rather than what one sees. We see the fleeting effects of light and the changing atmosphere of water and air painted right out of the tube in places with very thick paint. He's not trying to make waves. He's showing us the strokes of the paint. And painting in paint now that is made in factories. The artist no longer needs to know how to make their own paint. You can buy paint, you can buy brushes, you can buy easels, and go and paint plein air out in nature. Monet later on, when he moves out of Paris into the countryside in Giverny, he begins painting very mundane sources like these haystacks. He also has made color brighter by not using black in his shadows. Instead, his shadows will become greens and blues and purples, and they will dramatically brighten the canvas against the lights in the warmer colors. And he will, in effect, create a new art in this. And one also that is not delicately uh, chiaroscuroed and brushed by glazes, but done fairly quickly, the way you would need to paint outdoors as the light is changing. His later paintings, Water Lilies, which are massive, really are nearly abstract when you stand up close to them. It's not until you began to really get your senses in the painting do you see how he's painting the water lilies and the effect of light and reflection on the water. In Pierre-Auguste Renoir, in his, uh, in his paintings, we are seeing youth and the pleasures of youth. We are seeing people dressed in middle-class clothing, wearing store-bought hats, and we are seeing young people hanging out, flirting, drinking, having a good time, because we now have, because of the Industrial Revolution, we now have this burgeoning middle class that has enough money not only to pay for housing and food, but also money for pleasure too, money to have a good time. With Edgar Degas, Degas is exhibiting with the Impressionists, but his style is still kind of unique from them. He is working in qualities of, he's never sacrificing the form for color and light, I guess. 
And he's concentrated on these fleeting moments, often with dancers and ballerinas, and moving away from symmetry into asymmetric compositions. In Mary Cassette, we have an American painter born in Philadelphia who moves to Paris and becomes a friend and colleague of Degas and Renoir. She is mainly painting indoor scenes. She is also influenced by Japanese woodcuts that are coming now that Japan has opened up their borders. We're beginning to see art coming from Japan, from Hakusai and his great wave and other great Japanese artists, kind of flattening the pictorial space. What we're getting from Mary here is we're getting gentle, optimistic paintings of a mother and a child, and we're seeing a woman representing motherhood rather than a man doing it. And again, the influence in art from the Japanese prints is really kind of undeniable. Their daring use of negative space, their use of line uh, rather than um, undulating colors, their flat, unmodulated colors, and also their kind of daring vantage points, like in the Great Wave here by Hakusai. And this wave that threatens to overturn these small boats done with a thick outline and really interesting forms in the wave that is still very, very popular today. So this love of the Japanese uh, culture and artwork that's coming into Europe, Japanism, is the influence of Japanese art and fashion and aesthetics on Western culture. So coming from the 18 cities, 1860s Yukioe, the pictures of the floating world that is showing scenes of popular themes like beautiful woman, kabuki actors, sumo wrestlers, um, that have uh, erotica and landscapes and flora and fauna and travel scenes in them. We are seeing from the Europeans a real influence. And in fact, here is a early Vincent van Gogh, I guess not really early, 1887 to 1888. Uh, this is Vincent showing a friend in front of Japanese prints. And what we can say is that definitely Vincent is being influenced by these prints, which incidentally are being sold by his brother, Tio. Uh, Tio, who is also a fervent supporter of Van Gogh. The lure of the exotic in Oceana. So at the World's uh, Fair in 1889, they are viewing art from Asia and Africa and Oceania. We are finding uh, objects that are kind of very different in terms of how they're made, being um, not from industrial societies, linking gods and spirits with the, uh, the modern world. We are seeing people like the Maori in New Zealand who are working in these beautiful wood carvings. We see this in the meeting house that I'm showing you here. And we're also from the uh, islanders of the South Pacific. We are seeing tattooing, a sacred art performed with a bone comb with sharp teeth. The tattoo might symbolize specific ranks of power um, and also form as a protective function against bad spirits. Another popular form of art that will emerge in the 1880s and 90s is Art Nouveau. It begins in Belgium. It is art in nature. Nature in art is their motto. Sinuous curves, blossoms, leaves, and tendrils executed in iron, immortalized in places like the Paris Metro. Uh, also the glass designs of Tiffany in America. We see this really like short-lived style. It doesn't affect painting so much, but very much in the commercial arts. Toulouse-Lautrec is painting in Paris and is a post-impressionist in the 1890s. 
a, he has an accident, he is left with atrophied legs, he has family money, and spends his life, short life, in the dance halls and brothels depicting his, uh, the people around him and showing what um, life looks like and, and really for us today to see what life looks like and also doing a very kind of abstracted style that uh, is very influential on coming modern art. So in post-impressionism, this is loosely a group of artists who are using color more expressively and they are playing around with compositional structure and the formal language of art over those fleeting moments that the Impressionists are trying to capture. They're probably more influenced by Art Nouveau and Japanese prints than the Impressionists, but grew up in the legacy of the Impressionists. Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh is painting as an idealist with a life marred by loneliness, poverty, and depression. He has hereditary mental illness that will drive him to suicide. He sells fewer than a half dozen paintings in his, life, in his lifetime, painting landscapes and still lifes and portraits with bright colors, throbbing sinuous lines, and short, choppy brush strokes, using a palette knife right from the pure pigment rather than thinning it with turpentine. And his paintings are going to, his paintings are paintings really that when you see them live, I think you understand them more. Here we're seeing the Starry Night, where from his, his uh, the room from his asylum that he checks himself into at various times, we are seeing a turbulent sky and a moon that is so bright it's almost like it's daylight. We are also getting the, uh, the continuation of the Dutch landscapes that I showed you in the Baroque with the Protestant church that is grounded in the earth but the steeple that is piercing into the sky and kind of the conduit between the two. From Gauguin, who will join briefly Van Gogh in Arles and then ultimately have a knife thrown at him by Vincent, he will leave, leave the, uh, the European continent altogether and head towards Tahiti in the South Sea Pacific. He is taking on a self-conscious effort to assume the role that he calls the civilized savage. Kind of awful name there. And he shares this fascination with unspoiled nature that we see characterized in the writings of Rousseau in his revelries and also Thoreau in Walden. So in the Day of God in 1894, we see flat, brightly colored shapes, almost like a collage in a way. And a yellow and pink form that are forming rhythmic tapestry-like patterns that recall the style more of Japanese prints than, let's say, the Renaissance. And we see this kind of mood of serenity as the organic reflections in the foreground pool of water and the fetal positions on the figures on the shore suggest birth and regeneration. Surat. So Surat is rejecting the formlessness of Impressionism and inducing a, a new way of painting through these dots or these pointillisms. He is influenced by color theorists, and he is placing tiny dots of paint side by side, sometimes one inside of the other, to intensify color and to ultimately to make these points of dots from a distance make form. Here in the afternoon on the Grand Jetté, we are seeing Parisian middle-class people enjoying a day off in their Sunday clothes, we see dogs and pets, we see a child staring back at us, and light and shadow playing back and forth in this large work of art. Cezanne, I think, is different than the other artists that have, I've just gone over here in a lot of ways. So Cezanne begins as an Impressionist, and he ends up painting still lifes and landscapes and he is interested in building up color 
by small flat planes of color. And he is interested also in the flat shapes of Japanese prints where everything is equal in value. So we don't get distance in his work when he's doing Mont Saint Victoire. Instead, we get a sense of flatness and everything kind of becoming a almost like uh, they're patches of color that are being woven together in his artwork. And that is going to be very influential in the cubism of Pablo Picasso. In 19th century sculpture, Probably the leading sculptor of the day is August Rodin. And in Rodin, we get this kind of wonderful realism with a sense of organic movement and nervous energy. He is modeling form rapidly in clay, recreating the shifting effects of light and dark. And he is also playing around with these uh, monuments to former figures like Balzac and um, uh, paying homage to him in his, the writer's personality rather than any sort of physical likeness. In Italian opera, we are seeing the vertismo or truthism coming from people like Puccini in La Boheme and also in musical impressionism from Claude Debussy, he is saying, I would like to see creation, a kind of music without themes or motives. So he is finding his inspiration in symbolist poetry, especially the poet uh, Stefan uh, Marleman. And he would suggest rather than describe in his poetry, the ideal world of experience. So in Prelude to the Afternoon of Fawn, Debussy is going to create a 10 minute piece scored for a small orchestra whose predominantly wind and brass instruments create the mood of reverie evoked by the poem coming from Marlame. In a sensuous melody for uh, un unaccompanied uh, flute provides the opening theme that is then developed by oboes and clarinets. This will be choreographed and performed in Paris by the Russian dancer Nijinsky, and Nijinsky is going to enhance the sensuous evocation coming from the poet of a mythical fawn's effort to seduce a group of woodland nymphs. And in this ballet, we are going to see him play it barefoot, uh, erotic, and I think the dance itself is pretty fantastic. Here is a few seconds of it. Notice that the backdrop painting has kind of abstract forms to it, even though they're very naturalistic. The dancing of the nymphs reminds me a lot of the dance that we looked at from our chapter on the Greeks. There seems to be some formal qualities here that are similar yet different. Okay, what I want to take you to next So I'm kind of moving ahead in time a little bit into the 20th century. And in the 20th century, we're going to have a discussion on the art of Jeff Koons. 
So to kind of explain Coons, I want to explain some things that happen in the factory systems and in art and in industry in general. So how do we get to Jeff Coons at the end of this is kind of what I, I'm going to kind of show you. So number one, Fordism and manufacturing. So Fordism, named after Henry Ford, is a system of standardization in mass production. So you're standardizing the process, nothing handmade, everything made through machines and molds, not by skilled craftsmanship. And then the use of special purpose tools and equipment to make assembly lines. Tools designed to permit workers with low skill levels to operate assembly lines and do one task over and over and over again. And that is going to lead to the mass production of Ford's Model T's, and then also these workers are going to be able to make a higher paid living so they can even afford to purchase the products that they're making. Now these assembly lines no longer have humans but are made completely by machines. However, this is a very important process in America when we shift to manufacturing for World War II. So changing the assembly line from cars into tanks is not as difficult as building completely new factories and ultimately manufacturing and being and not having our factories bombed like they were in Jap Japan and in Germany is going to help the Europeans and the United States win the war and also lead to the United States being the factory capital of the world the industrial power of the world after World War II Industrialization is going to affect a lot of areas in life. I think farming is one clear way that it is affected. The invention of the tractor is going to completely revolutionize how much land one farmer can till over and also harvest. But we also see kind of some unseemly sides to the industrialization and having to feed millions of people, hundreds of millions of people in industrial farms where, for example, you can see here where the chickens clearly maybe not the most humane way for these chickens to live because they are existing not for their own existence but for food and are being only bred for food and to be as uh, succulent and as, as large as they can be as food. So Manufacturing and also the consumer culture of cities will lead to a culture of abundance where we don't need to be farmers to eat. We can simply go to a store and go to a grocery store where there are fruits and vegetables brought to us. Or in the case of this Duane Hansen sculpture, we see a woman who is not going for any fresh fruits and vegetables, but instead all the processed foods, the frozen foods, the Coca-Cola, uh, and drinks like that. And I think what Duane Hansen is showing us in this sculpture from 1970 of the supermarket shopper, maybe this life of abundance and consumerism is not the best thing for our health and for us mentally, as she has curlers, a cigarette in her mouth, and what appears to be a thousand-yard stare of indifference as she is shopping in her slippers. So Karl Marx uses a materialist approach to explain capitalist societies. In commodity fetishism, it is a perception that social relationships are involved in production, not as relationships amongst people, but as economic relationships among money and commodities exchanged in market trade. In A History of Class Consciousness by Gregory Lucas, he is starting the theory of commodity fetishism for his development of reification, the psychological transformation of an abstraction into a concrete object. So commodification is pervading every conscious human activity. As the growth of capitalism commodifies every sphere of human activity into a product that can be bought and sold on the market. Here we're looking at an artwork by Barbara Kruger that says, I shop, therefore I am. We fetishize the object, the iPhone, the way that it looks, the color of its shell. 
And we also judge people on the car that they drive, the clothes that they bought, the phones and computers that they carry around with them. We are often more judged on what we buy than our own personalities in society. Pop culture is going to grow in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s through television, which we will be looking at in our coming chapters. We are also going to see pop culture evolving in musical forms like rock and roll, which I have a lecture on in our final chapter. And all of this television, advertising, music is going to end up in art, in references in pop art or popular culture. That popular culture that everybody, that song everybody knows, that television show that everybody knows is going to find its way as references in pop art. Andy Warhol is going to make paintings of movie stars and show us these movie stars transform not simply as uh, actors and actresses, but also as high art themselves. In James Rosenquist, we are going to see his pop art coming from paint left over from his sign painting, where he is going to show us America as automobiles, sex, and Franco-American spaghetti. Cheap spaghetti bought in a can. That is summing up America, and again, popular culture in America. Another thing that will be affecting art that we will be talking about in later chapters is industrial processes in art. So here, Donald Judd, he is not touching the art or making the art. He is having it made to his specifications. And the art is showing us not a, uh, a sculpture that turns into a person or into a personality, but simply the beauty of geometric shapes itself that in many ways herald us back to Plato's forms and the purity of these forms in his minimalism. Also coming in the 60s will be conceptual art. The idea that the actual artwork is less important than the ideas presented by these artworks themselves. So we find in conceptual art less interest in form, more interest in idea. And I think a lot of these ideas come to our subject of our discussion, the art of Jeff Koons. So you're seeing Jeff in front of his tulips and also his balloon dog. Both of these are at the Broad Museum in Los Angeles if you want to see them. The balloon dog is a 10 foot tall sculpture that sold for about $60 million a few years ago. And Eli Broad, I believe, buys it for cost for about $3 million for the museum because Coons was going through a divorce. Robert Hughes, the art critic for Time Magazine, hated Coons describing him as having the slimy assurance and gross patter about transcendence through art of a blow-dried Baptist selling swamp acres in Florida. As a result, wrote Hughes, you can't imagine America's singularly depraved culture without him. So here we're looking at an artist who is using industrial processes, having other people manufacture his art to his specifications. Coons is, in effect, an auteur, like a film director having actors and film operators and editors make his vision come to life. So in Coons, we see kind of kitschy objects turned into monumental objects, like the heart that you're seeing that is a cheap plastic Ver the cheap plastic version would be something that you might give to your lover or your mother for Valentine's Day. Coons turns this through the process of the colored reflective steel into something monumental. So he is commenting on consumer culture. He is con uh, talking about pop culture, like in these ballerinas that might hearken to Degas, but in many ways to me hearken more towards Disney in the type of figures that they are. His early work is directly taken from consumer culture. He, and we will study where this comes from in the Dada artists in our next chapter, he is taking um, 
items that he is buying like vacuum cleaners and he is never using them, showing them new, putting them in plastic containers, lighting them with fluorescent lights, forever showing them in their new bought stage before they become dirty and broken down from use. Really celebrating our consumerism and showing it to us, reflecting it to us as an artwork. He has some unfortunate art that he makes when he made Made in Heaven, where he was thinking that he was neutralizing the shame around sex by depicting him and then his wife, a porn star known as La Ciccoloni, Ciccolina, who later will become part of the Italian parliament. So you are not looking at a photograph of those two, but that is a large painting of those two made by other artists to his specifications. He believes that he is taking on the art of the Rococo artists. And we are looking at that property of the Baroque and the Rococo. Um, and again, the kind of the nudity as nothing to be ashamed of. Many people though really hated this body of work. Ultimately, Coons will get a divorce. A lot of this work will be destroyed. And he gets back to doing what he does best. Realistic paintings of birthday cakes, porcelain statues of Michael Jackson and the chimp bubbles that he had in the 80s, and of course his steel. We are looking here at another painting in a work, a body of work from 1986 called Luxury and Degradation. He is trying to show that people should preserve their political and economic power rather than striving for luxury. So with this painting of this Hennessy ad, the civilized way to lay down the law, we are seeing the law student late at night stopping his work to enjoy luxury. And that Coons is saying, is that really a good idea? But at the same time, Coons is kind of duplicitous in his relationship to money. He says, sometimes I take a helicopter to travel to my farm, but I don't live a luxurious lifestyle. Clearly, I don't know what that is then, a luxurious lifestyle. This is also part of the sculpture, the steelwork that he was making in Luxury and Degradation. This was based on the type of prize you would get from buying enough liquor, and you would send in the bottle caps, and then you would get this rail car here filled with whiskey, and then you could keep its bottle as a kind of trophy celebrating your consumerism. Probably, more than likely, uh, him and his gallerist are running a Ponzi scheme where they are taking millions of dollars to produce his sculptures, in particular his more recent gazing balls, where he's not even making a balloon dogger anymore. He's just using the steel on plaster reproductions of sculptures, believing that people don't want to see art but want to see themselves reflected in this art. And... He is really milking it for all it's worth. So you have the Venus doll from the Venus of Vellendorf that we looked in our first chapter from the Paleolithic era. And maybe you can't afford the $20 million version. Maybe you can afford the small $50,000 version. And if that is too expensive, perhaps you can buy the $500 bottle of wine with the label of the Venus. So what do I want to do with all of this? I'd like you to watch this documentary on him and I'd like for you to kind of come up with your own conclusions. So you're gonna see kind of who he is, his own words and how he talks about his artwork. Is he kind of full of shit? Is he just really really shrewd? Is he honest? Is there something lacking in his honesty? I think you can judge this by, by watching the documentary. And I think the first 15 minutes, I, I think, are particularly good in kind of setting the stage for who he is. Now, this documentary, YouTube has muted parts of it that they don't own the rights to Led Zeppelin's When the Levy Breaks. So anytime you hear any silence, you might want to have the opening of the drum beat 
from Led Zeppelin. When the levee breaks, that's what they're playing uh, anytime there's silence in the documentary. So I would like to get your thoughts on Coons, uh, good or bad. It doesn't matter if you like him or doesn't matter. Uh, if you like him or hate him, uh, I'm totally open to it. I go through periods of loving and hating him. Uh, when I see those big shiny sculptures, I kind of am like, oh, they're so shiny. And then I look at them and I wonder, is just because something is $20 million, does that make it great art? Is that what it's about? Bigger, more expensive, better? Does that mean that it's great art? And I don't really believe that, but again, sometimes I have reactions to his art that say otherwise. So I'll talk to you soon. Looking forward to see what you write about, and uh, I hope you have fun going over the material. Talk to you soon.